the talk I wanted to present was abusing the MongoDB uplog. And I want to be switching back and forth between slides and code quite a bit. And I just I want to introduce what the uplog is, how it's used normally, and then how we can interact with the uplog and maybe do something interesting with it. So hi, I'm Ian. Uh, I'm from Utah at Super Shabam. So the plan. Um, Talk about the uplog, and one thing I've been using MongoDB for, or have used, is for time series data, um, storing lots of data points and being able to graph those. Um, and Wired Tiger really changes how you might go about trying to store that data. And I want to talk about just the difference between MMAP, the old database format, and Wired Tiger. So let's jump into the uplog. Um, it is used in replication. It's a capped collection in MongoDB. It's very much like a collection you can create just normally, um, except a capped collection that comes to an end. You say it can only take up 200 megabytes, and if you write one more document that would take up more space, it cuts off the last one and rewrites space. It just only is that big. Um, and it just stores documents. So the uplog is all operations you do to Mongo. If you insert a document, it goes into the uplog. Um, if you delete a document, it goes into the uplog, a record saying that this document with this query was executed that deleted these records. And this is how secondaries stay in sync. So you have a primary where one of the writes goes to the primary, and the secondaries that are lagging behind, they're following the uplog. That is what they're reading to stay in state so that if your primary goes down, you can fail over to one of your secondaries and it will be up to date with what your data was because it was looking at this collection called the uplog. So hopefully that's a good intro for what you'll be speaking up afterwards. Um, so a capped collection, just really briefly, is it's kind of like a ring buffer. It has that fixed size. It will override itself once you go over its configured size. Um, another interesting thing is it doesn't require there to be an index at all on ID. That, so since you don't have to maintain an index when you insert a document or delete a document, it can be very fast to write documents because there's no index to update or change. And indexes are what really slow down your performance when you're adding, removing, mutating documents is updating all the indexes that might apply. But it also means you can't get into the middle of the collection where you might want. You can't find documents easily. There's only one sort, which is natural, insertion order. Like, I want to start at the beginning, the first document I inserted into the uplog, and go forward. Or I want to start at the end, the most recent document I insert into uplog, and go backwards. Those are the only supported sorts that you have. And you can't delete documents out of a cat collection. Um, you can mutate them with great risk, because if you mutate them and it creates bigger space, then you can crash your Mongo server. So probably shouldn't mess with capped collections for mutating them. Just write and read them. Um, so all that's really to try to say that the uplog is a collection. It's maintained by Mongo, but it really is a collection like others that you could create yourself or maintain yourself. And that's what I wanted to get into right now. So we'll just get on this server. Is that big enough to see? All right, so I've got Mongo installed on the server and it's uh, in a replication set. You can see I'm on the primary here. And because it's a replication set, I can uh, query the uplog. I can say use local, switch to our local database. And inside of this, we've got a collection called the uplog.rs. And I can find documents in there. And the very first one I have is this initializing, initiating. That's when I first created this Mongo cluster. The first time Mongo turned on, it started this uh, cluster. And then I created a, a test collection. Um, this is the namespace. That's uh, what was being operated on, which collection was being operating on. Um, this is what the operation type was. This was a create. Uh, this was an insert. Um, this operation type, or sorry, this operation type was, I actually don't remember what the uh, acronym for that one is. Um, 
but we're going to look at creates and inserts mostly. And so all that's to say is it's very much a collection. I can even go to a tool called MongoDump, and I can say the database should be local, and I can say the collection should be uh, oplog.rs, and I'll dump out a bunch of data from my oplog, and I'll go to this dump folder that created for me, go to local, and I've got some bison, and I can do a bison dump of this oplog, and it's just like any other collection, if I wanted to dump it and get all the contents, back it up, like the oplog is a collection. So, there's no index on it by default. It lives in the local DB, it's not replicated. Since it's used for replication, it would be some sort of recursive mess if it actually backed itself up using itself. Um, and then, here are the fields. Um, the operation, that it, uh, main things are namespace, the database collection that it operated on, um, the operation that occurred, and what documents it affected. That can be a query, what queries were selected, what deletes were selected, um, if it wasn't insert, the entire document that was actually inserted. Um, it's kind of what you would write in the Mongo shell for updating a document. So, I already got to Mongo shell. So, what if we wanted to write a program that uh, was essentially like tail dash f on the uplog? Um, so, okay, where is my, sorry, I lost my server I wanted to be on. I'm gonna see some of my digital oceanness um, unwittingly. I logged into the wrong server. It doesn't have my Golang stuff. I wrote a program that's gonna tell the uplog and I wanted to show it off, but I logged into the wrong server. <laughs> I'm not prepared for that. Let's go to GitHub. Sorry, I'll pull it up in a bit. Oplog abuse. So if um, you wanted to look at this later, I've got a thing called tail. Are any of you Go programmers? Okay, so hopefully this is uh, readable anyways. Um, to tail the uplog, one of the um, things that, because there's only you can query from the beginning or the end and go forward or backwards, because there's only one index like the natural sort, um, just one nuance is to start tailing the uplog, you need to figure out what the last operation was. Um, figure out what the last document is, and you can do that with this find um, just a, uh, on the local collection uplog rs find, and you're doing a reverse sort. So you're starting from the end and going back, and you just want one document. And you figure out what the timestamp is, and then from there, we've got some documentation. You need the last timestamp to make a tailing query, um, and then you can make this other query, this iterator query that says, with a timestamp that's greater than or equal to the last timestamp I've seen in the database, uh, start replaying me the logs. And there's usually in your driver um, a hidden feature that you can tail forever, that like keep the cursor alive. And I've seen in like the Python or the Java one, they're both like, it's there and it's kind of like and and this flag not commonly used, but it's in, there in the drivers that I've seen. And then you get to just 
iterate over the op-log, and then you're seeing as new documents come in, you get to see them come across. So let me get this down. Uh, do I have git at least? Sorry. Uh, that was spacious. I had it there all along. All right. That makes me feel comfortable. It's on the right server. I just didn't read my directory. Um, all right. There's tail. Go run. Cool. We want this Mongo. All right. V dot pull the insert. There we go. Cool. So there's a program that's able to tell the op log, just like, and that's how the replication works. Um, how, set what secondaries are doing, they're just tailing the op log. And um, what you can do that's interesting is you can query just certain documents. You don't have to get the entire op log. You don't have to repl replicate everything that uh, MongoDB is doing. You don't have to do the whole database. And one thing that I thought was interesting, uh, interesting hack was um, for time series data to automatically roll things up to as you're inserting these individual data points to do statistics as you're inserting a data point. And that's the um, next program I wrote um, just to show off the the replication in stats. And it's fairly similar. It, um, has this function that will, uh, get the latest op log that we saw before and an op log channel. It's just doing this iterator and it's returning, um, all the op logs, um, what we have that is different is only metrics. I'm only, um, so this is my iterator query. Um, so before how I said I want only the op log documents that are greater than this timestamp, I'm also saying I only want the uh, documents that pertain to the metrics.raw collection. So if I'm only inserting into this one collection, I can get the op log just for that specific collection. And I only want this INU. That means I only want inserts and updates. I don't care about deletes. Um, for this specific case, for metrics, data points, um, I'm assuming I'm only going to be writing into this database. I'm not going to be removing any data points. And once I have a object that's been updated, I can uh, do this stats function right here. And that will pull in the, it gets the object ID of the object that was either inserted or updated, and it will query it, get the entire document, and it will do a bunch of, um, Percentages. It will get all of the the uh, values and do the min, do the max, do the 50th percentile, do the 98th percentile, and write that into a different collection. And so for data points, I can write into this raw collection all these individual data points, which are hard to query and make sense of. But if I have a summary database, which summarizes like an hour worth of data points into one document, which has a min, the max, and all these percentiles. I can query the summary database over a month of data very easily, but querying over a month of data points is a lot of data to process. And I don't really want all the raw data points. I just want the summary anyways. So if I run this program, the stats program, it automatically builds this other table for me. And that's something I can do right here. The Go run stats main. And 
for this one, I need to use matrix db.raw.insert. And actually, I've gotten this uh, written down because it's a very specific type that I'm expecting. So um, this is going to insert a document with a key, some metric, um, at. This is uh, flooring it to an hour. So all the documents, like there's one document that will have many data points in the values. And um, they'll all be floored to one hour document. And then they'll have an array of lots of data points inside this document. So if I write that, my uh, stats runner noticed it had a new ID that came across that matched its query. It was going into the metric database under the raw collection, and it wrote out a summary metric. So I can go to db.summary, uh, find, and uh, here's my 42. And so far, it's the only one, which I believe should be correct. I don't think I've messed with this database. Insert a few more and set the max on this one up to 999. Give it a, I've got it on a timer also to coalesce so it doesn't write all the time. It takes a minute to read the op log and then in expecting you to write many times to the same collection, then it spools it back out. So there it wrote, that's find. Cool, so I've got the min 42, the max 999, and I've got the uh, different sort of uh, quantiles across that metric. And the original database, if you're looking at db.raw, find is, so we've got some metric. There. And just this values object is an array that continues to expand and grow. Um, now, if you're familiar with Mongo version 1, this is a bad idea to have an array that's growing. Um, is that in Mongo version uh, with mmap, it's just memory mapped, and as you allocate a document for the first time, it slices away how much space it needs, and a little buffer, but not much buffer. And if you go past that, it has to reallocate the entire document, which is expensive, and if you're doing that across many documents, like with many different metrics, that is like rewriting, deleting a whole bunch of documents every time you're just expanding a document. But in WireTiger, uh, it uses a different algorithm. Every update um, is used as more of a, a database um, where the fields and columns are more, are handled individually and growing a document is much less expensive. And you can write many documents at the same time and they lock only on the document level. So if you're updating many different metrics in this way, it can handle each document on its own and update the fields and um, kind of in its own time, merge that down into memory instead of having to have all the memory for a document at once and just changing the fields. Um, an old way of doing this um, with version one was with um, this kind of bucketing where this is a uh, poorly formatted, but I've got this kind of the same thing, but instead of a values array, I've got a values object and it's kind of pre-allocated. The first time you insert a metric um, for an hour, it's pre-allocated with the um, seconds. Um, so 60 seconds for every minute and a 60 minutes in the hour. And you kind of pre-allocate this document with a bunch of nulls and then as a, doc, as a write happens, you change the null, update it into a value. And so that the document at the very beginning was allocated and then you can just update that and that was very fast but it also meant that you had a lot of wasted space and um, it means that you also only have precision that is one second and for some sort of, this is fairly good for data mate that might come through collect D servers that are coming on a regular schedule uh, with their metric updates, but if it's something like a web server who's logging its request time, which all of a sudden can be happening many times in a second, these different requests, having more of an array append, um, could be beneficial because you have many times in a second a different response rate. 
and be able to update that. So, um, back to the slides just to reiterate that the time series data, um, that's basically what I had. It's the, the time series with data points, bucketing, um, and that wire tiger. Um, the, the differences between um, MMAP and uh, wire tiger is the wire, wire tiger you have uh, no in place updates, but it's more efficient with expanding documents. Um, just some other resources. Other oplog abusers are Meteor.js, if you've heard of that. It, tails the uplog and spits that out to its own um, synchronization protocol for the website. So you can have a Mongo database and it will update browsers um, with what the current state of the database is. And it uses tailing the uplog for it. There's another project called uh, MoSQL, which tails Mongo and turns it into a Postgres database. And um, Tengen also has some examples using Mongo connector, which is uplog tailing. And, um, and I've just got some notes that help uh, me figure out how to create a tailable cursor, deal with the uplog, and that is all I have for you. Do you have any questions? What do you do if the primary changes? If the primary changes, that is, a, the, the local database is only to the, the one database, so you need to organize that if you were to use this sort of system to tell it and actually rely on it for data. Um, for a metric database like this one, it was kind of a easier solution because at any time you can redo the entire data. If you have the data points, you can redo the summary. But um, to do that more robustly, you need to tell the uplog, figure out when the primary changes and also turn your process on to start tailing the right uh, server. Because you, you're connecting to a remote server. You don't have to run it on the same server that you're on. I, I, that's just the way I had it. Oh. Just one thing, the uplog is not stored in the secondary? Um, uplogs are running on the secondary, I think they're always running. Um, but they should always be... I think the only problem you might have from there is you don't want to double redo work. If you're telling the same uplog and you're triggering two different processes to do the same work two times. If you are tailing the primary and you're also tailing a secondary, um, you don't want to trigger twice because it's the same uplog. Ah, okay. Um, say that again. Uh, I was wondering how you can tell which, which entries in the upload you've probably seen. There's, there was an ID with each entry, as far as I remember, right? Do you know, but it was a very long number, so is it, what is it, how is it generated? Is that, is that a timer or a counter or something? Oh, that, um, that ID that showed up briefly, that is an object ID. Um, whenever you insert a document into Mongo, it by default creates an underscore ID field yeah, with an object ID, the, and that's what yeah. that number was. And the, the entries in the um, in the upload, do they have like they don't have identifier <coughs> at all? They have a H field. Um, yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah. That something else then. Um, H. <coughs> yes. It's it's a number long. Um, there's no order to it. Mongo just tries to guarantee that that's a unique number in the upload. Just something. Yeah. So. That can be useful if you're scanning through the uplog, like your process died, mm -hmm. and you remember the last timestamp that you 
successfully got to, you can start telling the op log up until that timestamp and up until that uh, H value that you saw. And then that's the document that you broke on last. That's the last one you saw, and you can proceed after that one. I can, I can do that as a yeah, there's no order on this one, so you'd have to use timestamp and this age. So use timestamp to get to the right location, right uh, second, and then uh, use the age to verify that you got to the exact document that you wanted to that was on that time. When you go program the tail minus one, does it make such a blocking weight on the mobile driver? Or um, the hidden feature. I'm not sure how it is implemented on the driver side for this tail, um, but in the code itself, the iterator uh, calling next, it, it blocks until there's something available. If you read it, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, calling next right there, it's going to sit on code and it might just pause there until something happens. And the only way to stop that, to interrupt that, is to um, close the driver for the Go driver. There's not a good way to interrupt an iterator. Do you use, you, do you use your program for matrix or database analysis? Or? Um, so far, it's just been an experiment since Mongo is still very easy to throw data at. Um, and I wanted to, to play with Wire Tiger, especially with this idea. I've done this before where I pre-allocated these documents, and I thought that was kind of a pain. It's also hard to actually like, orchestrate when do you, when do you actually pre-allocate, when you insert it for the first time. Um, and that's a lot of document to send over to pre-allocate. And so when I saw Wire Tiger, and I thought that might be a good application for like a growing array that could have very descriptive data points. Um, and I guess that's one point is it's not a good idea to store individual data points as their own document as they each have to be indexed. And if you're just having so many documents, if you're storing a time step every second or multiple times a second, that your indexes just grow huge. So if you turn that data into one object that's bucketed over one hour, um, you can still get to your individual data points by first querying the hour that that should ha have in, getting all that data out and then sifting through it manually to own the few data points you want for like 15 minutes of data. Um, but it's important that there's only so many documents that need to be indexed and having a key and then a flattened hour is a, a fairly good way to keep the indexes very descriptive of the data that you want that narrow it down to the data you want, but also not having so much data. Thanks. Thank